I got to meet Dan through the Center for Wildlife and was amazed at his ability to talk to birds. And this isn't particularly what this program's about, but we've done a bird mm -hmm. um, program when we had COVID um, shut down. Dan came yeah. out and walked around the library and was listening and talking to the birds around us. And that's still on our website if you want to check out that program. It was amazing. Um, but tonight's program um, is called Cold Water, Cold Survivors and the story of wildlife in winter. And can you imagine being outside during those couple weeks ago when we had like the 30 below wind chills? Can you imagine surviving that? I don't know how they do, but animals do, and they have strategies and techniques, and it's really amazing what nature can do. Um, so as an expert naturalist, Dan Gardoki is the um, owner and entrepreneur of Lead With Nature. And he gives presentations, he does tracking um, and workshops online and in person. And if you have an opportunity, please check out his website because the programs and courses are amazing and I've done a couple of them so I can speak very highly of them. You come away learning so much and what you really know is there's so much more we can learn. Um, so you'll be amazed at the abilities of our wild animals and wildlife out so, out, right outside our door. Dan's been sharing his knowledge and passion for more the more than human world um, for over 30 years. A cert certified wildlife tracker, registered Maine guide. He got his MS in natural resources and served as a science faculty at Granite State College. He has served as science editor for bird language book, What the Robin Knows, and is well known for his uncanny bird mimicry. Mimicry? Mic mimic? I can't even talk tonight. So it's been a long day. Program here tonight. It's okay, sure. So, yeah. You're usually much better. Can you do a little bird Sure. Uh, so I name a bird that you really like. A hard one, not chickadee. Don't do chickadee. Because <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Depends what chickadee called it anyway. Gross. Oh, grouse? You're not going to like this one. Let's see. There's one. There's another one. Thanks. Usually it's whistles. Like. That's what I'm looking for. They, I've heard them ye yelp a bunch when they attacked me one. Oh, cool. Awesome. All right. So we're going to learn all about cold weather wildlife survival tonight. Because you were overlooking at the books, and I thought when this book came in, I immediately thought of Dan. And it's called Who Done It? The Scat Book? <laughs> oh, nice. And a forest floor mystery. And it talks all about scat and what different ones look like. Everyone does it. And how about the night lunch? Oh. So there's all kinds of fun books, not just for children. No. Thank you. Dan. Thanks, Sharon. Well, thanks everyone for um, showing up here live tonight, and for those who are watching later. Um, I just want to start by uh, acknowledging a lot of teachers. So here's one right on this slide. Here we've got this beautiful. Who's that? What do we? Yeah, we call that animal bobcat today, right? It's probably gone by many names, depending on who you are. Uh, someone might even have a personal name for that. Other bobcats probably know it by a very different name than bobcat. Um, this was a big male bobcat. I just call him Tom. Sometimes I call him Tommy. Um, I actually never saw him in person. These are all remote trail camera pictures that I got him. They got of him. He was he outsmarted me quite a bit. Um, and that's because generally speaking, most wild animals are generally a bit more savvy than most of us. I'm going to say right now. No offense. Um, they've been around a lot longer than us, a lot, lot longer than us. They figured out a lot of things about how to live in this world, including how to stay warm in winter, how to get food, how to take care of their family, how to protect themselves. Um, they know a lot. They're actually, they have a lot of wisdom, I'm going to say. So uh, I have a lot of gratitude for them. And um, a lot of what I'm going to share tonight is 
you know, is, is me talking through my, my opinion, my beliefs, my knowledge, and my experience, but that comes from lots of places. So lots of my own teachers, wild animals, other humans, um, modern kind of Western science, you know, I studied wildlife conservation, and um, also indigenous knowledge, so native peoples from different areas. And so here we are in Wabanaki territory, and you know, there's a lot of wisdom that comes that has been lost through indigenous wisdom um, that we're starting to find and reintegrate into our understanding. And a lot of the things we're learning today about wild animals and wild places, things like how trees talk to each other and communicate and cooperate, that's all stuff that's been known for millennia. We just forgot it. <laughs> so a lot of I'll share tonight will be old and new at the same time. So any point we're going along, if you have a question, just ask. I, I, don't worry about interrupting me. Um, curiosity is your friend. So having questions and being curious is a good thing. That's one of the ways we learn. So I invite it. So little overview. So winter isn't a dead time of year. There's a ton going on in winter. There's so much going on uh, outside. You know, we often will think, oh, it's so cold and it's dark and there's not much happening, but it's just not really true. Just because it's not green and you don't hear a lot of like, and actually you can hear that, bird calls, uh, doesn't mean it's really dead. Sure, there's less wildlife around because things migrate, things hibernate, we'll get into all that, but they're actually easier to see because there's no leaves on the trees, generally speaking, unless they're evergreens. And, but the thing is, you have to go look. You gotta actually give your attention to what I just call this more than human world, right? We live in a world that has humans, like us, but it has way more than humans. And it's easy to forget that and to just think about the whole human thing, like other people and stuff. So the snow, when we get it, is super helpful, which we're gonna get tonight and tomorrow, hopefully, quite a bit. And that will give us little clues, right? And so if we have routines of going outside, if we regularly spend time outside of these little boxes that are temperature controlled that we live in, we'll actually learn a lot more about those things. So be curious, share it with others, have a good time. So let's look at some nearby critters because everyone likes pictures and things like that. Whoop! Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah. So we call this one red fox today, right? This animal right now is probably sniffing around, maybe even making some little scent marks right in these neighborhoods. This time of year is mating season for red foxes, the courtship season. So it's a time of year you could see two foxes together traveling. Right, that's pretty common, and you'll smell them. Anyone know what fox pee smells like? What do you think? Strong. Yeah, it's really skunky and strong and sharp. And actually, most of the time when you smell a skunky smell and it's below freezing out, it's probably fox pee, red fox pee to be specific. Um, so in this case, this fox is, what's it doing? Hunting. Just being goofy? Yeah, probably hunting, and maybe like sticking its face in the snow. I do, it feels good. Yeah, so under that snow and that whole world below the snow, there's things like voles and mice and shrews, and we'll get into all that. So that's probably what that fox is up to right there. Poof. And hard to say how it did. So why do we even have seasons, right? Sometimes I just like to back up and be like, wait, what's going on? Why is it cold out? So this time of year, all, it's just about this tilt, right? The earth is just kind of like, sun, no, and it's over here. So everything gets colder. We're just tilted farther from the sun. We're actually not, we're not actually terribly far from the sun, but just that little bit of a tilt on our earth's axis makes a huge difference in terms of our temperature and our, all of our currents and our, so, you know, our weather system. So that's why it's pretty chilly. And so when it gets to this cold, low angle sun time of year, animals, wildlife, because we're animals too. Any mammals in the room? Yeah, 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 all your hands. Yeah, exactly. So we ha basically have three options, right? So our wild neighbors out there have three options every winter. <clears throat> and the first one is to get out of here. And some of us do this too. Some of us take little trips or sometimes we go away for the whole winter. Might be some snowbirds are just kind of like, yeah, I'll see you again in May. Bye-bye. Anyone know any humans who migrate? Yeah, you know, a few of those, yeah. So let's look at another critter who migrates. So what you're about to see is this is known as an abundance map and it's going to like flash colors kind of slowly up and down. And so what's going to happen is um, right down here, the darker the color, the more these animals exist. This is an abundance map for a ruby throated hummingbird. Yeah, they don't really whistle. They make, you know, funny things. So the hummingbirds are all hanging out pretty much in Central America. 
in Mexico this time of year. You get some in Mexico, you get some down in Florida, you, know, you get a bunch here along the border sometimes. And this is in January. So as I, as I hit play, you're going to see as the months go on, this little thing's going to move February, March, April, May, June, July. So the middle is summer and it's going to go back to winter. So watch what happens. Watch the pulse of migration as these animals slowly, right, March, pff, April, May, June, July, breeding season, August, September. And then they're like, yeah, I think we better go back. And they get sucked back down. It's almost like a big breath in and a breath out. And that's why we don't see hummingbirds this time of year, right? Hummingbirds need warm weather. Yeah, because they eat flowers, nectar. Nectar and flowers, yeah. Anyone seen any nectar out there today? Probably not a lot. You can get a little bit. Last few days when it got warm, say you put a little hole in a tree. Anyone tap maple trees for sh uh, syrup, sugar? They can eat that. In fact, they do. And when they're migrating north in the spring, one of the things, one of the many things we're relearning is that they actually follow a certain bird around. This little bird who likes to go up to trees and go, and then move over, and then move over, and make this perfect little line of holes right along a tree. Anyone know what that bird is? It's a type of woodpecker called yellow-bellied sapsucker. It's a real thing. And sapsuckers make these beautiful little lines and they open up the tree and they get into that little cambium layer where all the energy of the tree is kind of like the tree's blood and then it starts to drip out that sap. That's what we do too this time of year if we're making maple syrup or maple sugar. So they follow those sapsuckers, the male hummingbirds when they're migrating north. They're the first ones to go up. They're trying to get this great piece of territory so that when the females arrive, they're like, hey, check this out. This is awesome. You want to hang out here? This is a good spot. Let me tell, let me tell you, it's got this, it's got that. I can even start a nest. So they do that and they follow these little sap suckers around and then they get that bit of, a, that bit of nectar because there's really almost no nectar available in late April, hardly any. So pretty smart. Again, just they know a lot. They've been doing this for millions of years. We shouldn't be surprised that these animals are really this smart. So yeah, sure. And I should know the answer to this, but I have the same feeders in the same place, so yeah. I always think it's the same hummingbird that mm -hmm. comes back to my feeder. Right. Is it? Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, they don't have terribly long lifespans. I mean, it's unusual for a hummingbird in the wild to live more than a few years. So you could have maybe one, two, maybe three years would be a big deal. But you probably have the offspring or the relatives of that but bird. But they, they go back to the same place there? Yeah, they often will. Yeah, they often will or close nearby. Yeah, so they know. They know all these little spots. They know all. They have this whole map in their mind as they're migrating, too. It's not just where they end up for the summer, but think about that whole journey. They have to know very like detailed little bits of knowledge. Like if you were to walk from here to Boston, and you have to like say you needed water you only can bring like a small water bottle you have to know a lot of places to get water right so like okay well there's uh let's see that cumberland farm usually has a sink over by the coffee i can refill there that's free water nice you have no money either right so you have to get really smart and think about where to get things these birds have very detailed intimate knowledge of the landscape they know exactly where to get what they need so that's the first option and most of the things that migrate are birds because they've got wings but can you think of any insects that migrate there's one popular one most people know. Yeah, butterflies, right? Certain butterflies migrate. Any other insects? Hmm. Wasps? Oh, good guess. Not that I'm aware of. Dragonflies. The big dragonflies. The darners especially. Green darners, some of those. Yeah, those things migrate. And one time we were out, I had a group, a college group I was leading, we were on the Isles of Shoals, so offshore here. like. And it was September and we were poking around at night just being curious because I said, go out and be curious. Just like look at things, pick stuff up, turn stuff over, gently kind of peek. And someone lifted up a little branch of a little fir tree and she lifted up and she heard <laughs> like flappy, hard little plastic wings <gasps> and she dropped. She got a little freaked out. And uh, I was like, what? She goes, I don't know, something just like buzzed at me. And I was like, okay, well, let's look. So we took a little light and we gently looked under. And there was a big green darner. And then we looked again. I was like, no, wait, there's two, three, four. There was about seven green darners on the underside of this little fir tree. It's a very tiny little fir tree just resting overnight in the Isles of Shoals. We got up the next morning, and we didn't go back to the tree until an hour after sunrise. They were already all gone. They already resumed their journey, and they're on their way. It was a nice warm morning. So they can migrate. Uh, some fish migrate. Some mammals, not too many mammals migrate. So, but this is really a great option if you got wings. Migration is awesome if you have wings. 
<laughs> the next option is to hibernate, right? And we're going to talk about some big fancy weird words like dormancy and torpor and brumation and all this stuff. But basically, to shut down, turn down your thermostat, and this is a really weird little gif of like, this is a, anyone recognize this frog? It has a little gray black mask right there over its eye. They're all around here. They breed in vernal pools. Wood frog. Wood frog, yeah. They have that. Like, Almost like a duck, like sometimes. Yeah, so little wood frogs, they'll be calling before you know it, usually by early April these days, sometimes late March. And they can actually, we'll talk about freeze solids. This is a picture of a wood frog freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. It's kind of crazy. It doesn't happen that fast. That's a time lapse picture. But most insects do this, most reptiles and amphibians do this, and some mammals. And we'll dive into how that all works. So, Hibernation is like when I was a kid, back when I was, well, you're seven, I was nine, you know, whatever, 12, something like that. I was a kid, and uh, I just thought like hibernation meant all these animals just went into these caves and they just slept all winter. That's not really how it works. It's a little more complicated. Um, some do that. In fact, can we think of any mammals around here that literally go to sleep for like at least six or seven months of the year? That's hard because there's not many of them. I used to think it was bears, but rarely do they do that. Sheep bucks. Close, but not quite. There's one uh, you were talking about earlier. Yeah. I saw a chipmunk yesterday, little tracks on the stove. If it gets usually above 30 or so, they'll come out and about, and they'll go back. They'll sleep. Depends on the weather. Uh, there's one who's a really good digger who likes to eat in your garden. No, they are really good diggers. They would eat. That's a good guess, too. No. Nope. Woodchuck. Play this game. Woodchuck. There's one. Boom. So groundhog or woodchuck, same animal. They are deep hibernators. Right. Uh, there's another one most people don't even know about. It has a really long tail and can go boing, boing, and bounce really far, but it's really tiny. It's called a jumping mouse. We have two species of those that hibernate. And then there's one that flies, a mammal that flies. There's a couple. Nope. They're active all winter long. I like it, though. I like the guesses. Keep throwing them out there. This one makes a high pitch. Can't do it. Have you ever had them in your attic? Bats. Yeah, bats. So a lot of our, we have bats who actually hibernate, right? We don't think about them because they're usually hidden somewhere where we can't see them. But those are the only mammals that really hibernate. So hibernation is really like a bunch of things. I call it a suite of adaptations, both behavioral, meaning things the animals are doing, and physiological, things on the inside of their bodies that change so they can survive the winter. So they slow down their whole like life process. So for instance, it's like someone really turning down a thermostat. Their heart rate goes from or to the slower you go, the less energy you need. Their metabolism, they don't get hungry anymore. They don't have to eat. They don't have to pee or poop. Everything shuts down. Their kidneys stop. Because they really stink if you're sleeping. All of a sudden, you have to pee and poop. Because then you end up laying in your pee and poop. No one wants to do that. Their, 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 uh, their respiration, their breathing, their deep, they, they don't want to go um, to lose all of their moisture. So they would dehydrate if they did that. So a lot of things slow down. And then their body temperature goes way down too. So if you were to go put your hand on a woodchuck in its den, it would be kind of cold. You'd be like, ooh, that's a little weird. But almost, you think like maybe it's almost dead, but it's not. It's just barely alive. This goes for a lot of hibernators, turtles and frogs. Some of the frogs, like I said, will freeze solid. So all of these things happen and this saves a ton of energy. So you can get ready for hibernation. There's a lot of different ways to do that. And then you can make it through that really long period where it's hard to survive for you, especially if you're something like a turtle, right? It's really hard to make it through a winter if you're a turtle. You tend to eat green things, leaves. You tend to eat uh, sometimes other things, hmm, invertebrates, insects, some even eat fish, but it's hard to be a turtle in winter. So you say, I'm just going to go bury myself in the mud and hopefully I'm going to make it six or seven months. No, it's kind of crazy. So it's kind of a matter of degree. So we have not hibernating or animals that are fully active. So this isn't really hibernation. So there's like classic example. We got a moose, right? Moose do not hibernate at all. Moose actually eat more in the winter and they have to move more to get more food. They expand their range. So in the summer, where do you expect to find a moose? Like you said, picture a picture of a moose in the summer. The moose is in, Swamp. yeah, it's in the water usually, right? They're eating aquatic plants. Now in the winter time, moose go usually up higher. 
They go up higher in the hills and the mountains where they're eating more woody twigs. They basically eat twigs all winter. I don't suggest you try that diet. They have to eat a lot of twigs. We're talking 40, 60 pounds of twigs, sometimes for an adult moose, a ton of food. Then they have to chew it all, swallow it, kind of puke it back up, chew it all again, swallow it again to get all the nutrients they can out of it. It's a lot. Yeah. They're what we call ruminants. They're, they, they're browsing and then they eat and they reprocess their food and it goes through multiple chambers in their stomach to get every little morsel to help them survive. Then we have these kind of like middle of the road animals. We call them mild hibernators or their easier word is called torpor. Torpor species are animals that kind of hibernate when it's really cold but then wake up when it's not. Skunks, chipmunks, raccoons, possums, things like that. If it's really cold, they'd be like, oh yeah, I'm shutting down. And then it's like, oh, it's warm enough, I'm gonna go out. Bears are actually like this too, especially young male bears. So there's a raccoon coming out during a nice warm day, like, oh, this is great. Look, at there's all this food, someone left the garbage cans out, I'm happy, all right? And then there's deep hibernation, which we just talked about, and very few critters do this. There's a tiny little woodland jumping mouse in the palm of someone's hand, all right? And that's how tiny they are, beautiful little critters. And they, they, they need to eat grass seeds to survive um, versus your typical uh, like white-footed mouse who can eat just about anything. So they tend to hibernate because there's not a lot of grass seeds available in the dead of winter. Alrighty. Reptiles, amphibians. We already know what they're doing. They're hibernating. So, you know, we've got all sorts of different snakes here. We've got some, not many of these right around here. Anyone recognize that snake with that funky shaped head? And these little markings? Yeah, that's a rattlesnake, <laughs> or copperhead and a rattlesnake in there. And then who's this over here peeking through the snow? Like, uh, real bumpy, all of these little bumps all over its body. Yeah, close. It's a toad. That's a toad. Yeah. So they do these things we call brumation, which is just a fancy word for reptiles and amphibians kind of hibernating. Um, they, they can't make their own heat with their body. They need the sunshine and other things around them to be warm. So they will either allow their bodies to freeze solid or they will use things we're gonna talk about in a second. They basically use antifreeze like you put in your car so your little car engine block doesn't freeze if you have a car with an engine like that. Um, so they use these strategies to make it through the winter. And then the third strategy is to do this. <laughs> Uh, it's to just kind of like tolerate the winter, to stay active and adapt, to make it through the winter. You might even say to thrive in the winter. So this little guy, what things is this little squirrel doing right here to stay warm in this moment? What's going on inside and out? What do you think? Throw some things out there. He's got his tail up against him. Exactly. That super warm, fluffy tail is being used like a coat on its back. So that's going to keep all that warmth that might want to like radiate off its back. It's keeping it close to its body. Yeah. Anything else? It's shivering a little bit and that actually does generate heat to a point. It can only last so long, but yeah, it's uh, when you rapidly contract your muscles really fast, they shiver and that actually it's called shivering thermogenesis. It creates a little bit of heat. Um, eventually you're going to want to eat. So you don't have to do that all the time because if you do too much, you're going to wear out all of your reserves. Look how it's pulling its hands in and it's kind of tucking itself. So it's making itself more into a ball, right? So it's making its shape much more round. It's reducing its like surface area. So if a squirrel is out there like this, it would get cool really fast. If it's like this, it's gonna stay warm. Just like you. When you're cold, you tend to do that. And when you're hot, you tend to do this. We're mammals too, we do the same thing. <clears throat> this squirrel also has a really thick winter coat going on. This squirrel also, was able to eat so much food in the fall, more than usual, so it can build up some fat reserves. And this squirrel gathered a ton of food. This squirrel did a lot of hard work in order to be ready to make it through the winter. So it has a huge pile of food, a cache you might say, or uh, a food hidden away that it can go and eat from in order to stay, you know, pretty warm all winter long. And it's protecting that cache too. That's why they tend to get really angry when you get close to them sometimes. They go, Right, they do all sorts of stuff. They're kind of kind of crabby, but I get it. Exactly. Now let's look at some of our other active carnivores. So carnivores are meat eaters. Doesn't mean they only eat meat, but they're generally eating meat. I want to recognize this carnivore. My backyard, I'll be nice. So it is another fox, but this isn't the red fox. Notice how this one has a 
little black tip on the tail. It has kind of a grayish nose, a white chin, a little bit of red. Yeah, that's the gray fox. Yeah, so, yeah, now it's time to eat. Okay, yeah, they're all. Eleven night. Are they they're making? Red, though. And okay. Then they get the the black teal. I don't know. Yep, they have a little black line down their back, and they're doing a little mate courtship this time of year too. You might hear like a ah ah. <laughs> they have all sorts of weird barks, and the red foxes do a really loud, annoying. Well, some people think it's blood curdling, but it's like this. <laughs> like it can sound really freaky. A lot of people attribute that to fishers, which uh, they actually don't do that. Uh, but we, uh, for some reason in New England, we think fishers scream all the time. But there's actually very little evidence that fishers make any noise more than deep growls. Could be occasionally it happens. But all the videos you see, it's like just dark. It's almost like, there's a fisher screaming over there. And you never see the fisher. It's not like a cat, actually. Yeah, well, I disagree, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is our gray fox, right? So this one we will hear and see now and again. Um, here's a little, uh, one of our smaller weasels that's pretty active in winter that turns pure white. We call them ermines or long tail weasels. Just poking around someone's wood yard. <laughs> long and lean. Oh, now he's going up inside someone's truck. You don't want that. They'll sometimes chew your wires. Always sniffing and looking and popping in and out of holes. Every little crevice it can get in. This one looks like it's rubbing its body around, probably spreading its scent. Digging. They like to get into the tiny little tunnels under the snow when they can and chase little critters, but they're super curious. <coughs> oh, there you go. You may have heard pop goes the weasel. That's because they do that. Pop, pop, pop. They just kind of like pop up and down all the time. Um, they're kind of crazy. So we have these guys and we also have their bigger cousins called long tail weasels. And then we have mink and then we have fisher and then we have otter. We have a lot of weasels in our area. How about this one? Yeah. So this is one you probably hear that like, I mean, it's really varies. Sometimes it's more and it varies because they have, they have both coyote and wolf DNA in them. So they sound kind of wolfy. Sometimes they can be bigger. They can be smaller. They can be redder. They can be grayer. There's a lot of variation in our wild canids because they've got a long story of interbreeding from the Western, you know, when, 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 a lot of Europeans first came here 500 years ago. There was a native and a large canid or wild dog like this in this area. It was actually a bit bigger. Some people called it a brush wolf. Some people called it an eastern wolf. Some people called it a red wolf. That thing was eliminated. People did not like it. They were uncomfortable around it. They'd survived through the plague in Europe and they had a bad experience with wolves there. So most of the wolves were killed, unfortunately. And as a result, there was no large canines here. Well, a couple hundred years later, the coyotes from out west, which are much dinkier and smaller. If you've ever been out west, you've seen them. They're just little tiny things, usually. They rarely get above 25 pounds, 30 pounds at the most. They started spreading east. And as they did that, they interbred with the wolves up in the Great Lakes region. And as a result, the animal we have here in the east is kind of like a cross between a wolf and a coyote in some ways. And that's why they can get quite big. I mean, there's been some that have been captured over 60 pounds. Which is, you know, kind of like, well, that's pretty much a wolf. I mean, depends how you define it. Uh, but, it, you know, it's a big mix, and it's kind of just a challenge to even give it a name. What about the dogs? There's one's mixed with dogs now, breed. Yeah, occasionally you get a generation that'll do that. They rarely succeed beyond a couple of generations, because if it's the male coyote, he's not there to help raise the young. And believe it or not, the males actually are sometimes useful that way in, the, in this species. And if it's the female, She's usually giving birth back at home. If, she's the, if it's a female dog, she's giving birth at home, and then those pups don't end up in the wild. So rarely does that, that, that work beyond a generation. But <clears throat> we have a very interesting mix, and they can look really different. And in the summertime, they look really skinny, and this time of year, they look really fluffy, right? They got these amazing winter coats. And our, our coyotes are, you know, here is they tend to be in family groups, smaller family groups, sometimes bigger family groups this time of year. They're also getting close to their courtship time, which is a little later, usually mid-March around here. Um, and they'll be making a racket out in the woods, <laughs> chasing down all sorts of food. Everything from tiny little small mammals and birds to pretty big deer. Uh, scavenging, hunting, you name it. Snowshoe hares, squirrels. And then if we go further north, we get this freaky character. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have these here, but um, historically, the range of the Canada lynx came all the way down, probably into northern York County at some point in time. And this animal is just bizarre. It actually weighs about the same as the bobcat, but it's much taller and much lankier. Um, and it's got huge hind feet. 
I mean, it's basically like a massive uh, snowshoe hare, which is what it eats all the time. So this is our Canada lynx. It's got this much bigger ruff around the face, these funny pointy kind of a uh, little antenna almost sticking off of their ears. And um, this animal, actually Maine has the, den the highest population of lynx in the lower 48 in all of uh, America. Uh, mostly north and west of a uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, Route 201, kind of up around the lakes region, uh, up around Moosehead, and then all the way up to the northern tier of the state. So we have a lot of lynx up there, um, but not down here. Here we have bobcat. The coat on this animal is so thick and so warm that, you know, even like the moose, these animals aren't getting terribly cold. So we think about winter and we think it must be so cold, but they have amazing under fur and then they have these long guard hairs and they're really good at keeping them in good shape. And they, when it gets windy, they go out of the wind. If it's sunny, they'll go sit in the sun. So sure, I'm sure they get cold and uncomfortable at times, but you know, moose in research situations that have been found, if it gets above like the mid thirties, they actually start to like huff a butt. They start to get seem seemingly uncomfortable. It's too warm for them. Uh, so yeah, so they're actually are much happier. You might know people like this who are just always hot. They're just like, open the windows, do I? You know, they're, that's kind of like a lot of these animals. <laughs> they're just, you know, now granted, it's, you know, 20, 30 below with a wind chill. They're going to have to find somewhere to hole up and stay warm. But rarely does that weather last very long. Now we go to the herbivores, right? So these are ones who are generally eating plant matter. So a little bit different story. They don't have to travel as far per se. They can have safety in numbers. So this is what we might call a deer yard or a deer wintering area, which we actually have a couple in Berwick that the state has recognized. And these are areas where deer, once the snow gets deep, tend to congregate. So the deer, when the snow gets deep, it's really hard to be a deer because you've got these dinky little pointy feet and you're pretty heavy. So you fall and poke through the snow a lot. So anyone who's ever like post hold while walking through the snow, imagine doing that with even tinier feet like a thousand times a day, you'd be exhausted. It's just, it's hard to survive as a deer and in deep cold snowy winters and also late snowstorms in winter. So they will gather in these areas where there's paths they use all the time that are so matted down, it looks like a highway. I was walking on some last weekend um, in around Bethel, Maine. And I mean, it was literally just like, it looked like someone had a snowshoe, a little, like a little cart and cleared a path, like a tiny plow. Um, and then those areas, they feel safer. There's more of them there. So if someone's after them, like coyotes, they can, you know, they have a better chance of surviving because there's more of them around. Um, but it's also easier for the coyotes to find them because they are all in the deer yards, but it usually works out for them. So deer are pretty good in the cold, but again, long, late winter, cold storms late in the year can be really hard on them. Do they tend to yeah. like get close together to share? Not, I mean, a little bit. Really, right? Yeah, they're tend to be using, so in this picture you can see they're probably in, looks like maybe a spruce, a dense stand of spruce or fir or even hemlocks. They'll tend to use the trees as their kind of blankets. Yeah. So they tend to bed, you know, if people probably wander around the woods, you see deer beds are usually underneath conifers, underneath trees that keep them warmer. Because just like you, if you camped out and you laid out in the open here behind the library, you get really cold at night because nothing is bouncing back your heat. If you camp in the woods under thick hemlocks or, uh, or fir trees or something, you're going to be a little bit warmer because that, that warmth is actually going to be kept in a little bit longer and you're going to stay much, much cozier. It makes a big difference. It might not seem like it, but it can make quite a difference. So they'll bed next somewhat near each other, but they rarely like huddle or anything. Might be a few feet apart. Yeah. You know, so when I've seen when the deer come in our yard, there's usually one or two like lookouts that would be off to the side. Mm. Makes sense. Kind of scanning the periphery. Yeah. Um, and I would assume they're looking for any kind of movement that's going to be detrimental to their survival. Yep. Smell, sight, sound. I mean, deer are like, yeah, sensory machines. Those ears are massive when they can turn them so many ways. Those noses are ridiculously strong. Those eyes are really powerful. I mean, they are just, yeah, they're extremely sharp if they want to be. <laughs> how, do they, do they, how do they communicate with one another? Oh, all sorts of sounds, smells, scents, they make noises, uh, mostly body language, <clears throat> and they're always keeping an eye on each other. I mean, it's kind of like, think about if you, you know, say, you know, especially when you have like a young family and you travel somewhere and somewhere new, and maybe it's like, I don't know, a concert or somewhere, or a big park or a fair, you know, mom and dad are always keeping an eye on the kids. Kids are making sure they don't totally lose the parents now and again. <laughs> like you're, you're reading each other. You're watching your little flock and you're paying attention. And sometimes you have little whistles or calls and things like that. So, I mean, you know, they have 
very similar things going on with them. And they'll actually even emit different smells. Like if you startle a deer, you know, and it takes off, it's going to release smells from those pedal glands and the toes, and that's going to go downwind, and that's going to let other deer know that, like, that deer, if they didn't happen to hear it or see it, they're going to be like, whoa, that a deer just got really scared over there. What's over there? So there's a lot of ways that they're communicating to stay safe. Yeah. All right. Hmm, look at this. So that's a picture that's like a lawn. That could be right outside the library. It could be outside your house. It could be anywhere. And it's got all these little runways and tunnels. Some of them go under the snow. Some are exposed. They're maybe about an inch and a half, two inches wide. Some of them have tiny little tracks in them. Some don't. And it looks like kind of like a network of veins or, or a little like, I don't know, <clears throat> a little like a tree pattern. So who might do that? Yeah, so if it were a mole with an M, it would probably be underground. Yeah, if it was a vole with a V, it's usually going to be above the ground and eating all the grass. Yeah, so this would be our friend, looks like a little sausage, a little furry sausage, cute little guy. That's the meadow vole. And meadow voles tend to make these little networks, these little cities, these little runways, and they like to get underneath that snow, which we'll talk about in a minute. But when the snow melts back, we often can see where they've been. And sometimes you can even find little nests maybe where they were even, because they can breed even in winter. Sometimes you find little latrines where they leave tiny little piles of poop. <laughs> Looks like kind of like mouse poop, but a little straighter and greener usually. Um, <clears throat> but you can see the vole has kind of small, its ears are not terribly huge. It's got pretty small eyes and it doesn't have a really long tail. Whereas a mouse is going to have those big ears, big eyes and a long tail. And the mole is going to have those huge front feet for digging, almost no eyes or ears visible. And then there's the shrew. And the shrew is a funky little character with a really pointy nose, really tiny eyes, really tiny ears. And they do just about anything they want. They'll go above ground, sometimes underground. And they're really stinky, though. A lot of animals don't like to eat them because when they bite them and put them in their mouth, they have these really big scent glands on their sides, these musk glands, and the animals will spit them out. So one of their strategies is they've learned to be disgusting. So I've, there's many times I've been trailing like a coyote or a fox and all of a sudden it jumps off the trail, grabs something, and it goes bleh, and, it, and you find this sad little dead shrew that's like got saliva on it that got crushed but then spit out. So that animal learns quickly, oh, don't eat those, those are gross. So it stinks for the one who got eaten, but maybe its offspring or its cousins aren't going to get killed because, you know, that fox now knows or that coyote knows, don't eat those things, they're gross. <laughs> right. Oh, look at these cute guys. <clears throat> so this is a picture like a hole in a tree. <clears throat> um, and all these little critters poking their head out. Someone might have tapped on that tree. I don't know. Could have been me. Could have been someone else. Just saying. Uh, these animals tend to be active mostly at night. Um, they have these huge eyes, tiny little ears. Anyone recognize them? No, they're much smaller. I know there's no scale here. It's hard to see. These are flying squirrels. And flying squirrels are pretty common. They're all over the place. Like, yeah. all over. <laughs> We often just don't know about it. If you ever had them in your house, you'd know about them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're totally nocturnal. And yeah, they glide around at night. If you happen to have like a bird feeder, like a tray feeder, like a flat open feeder, they will visit those at night sometimes, especially if you put little nuts or seeds out there. Yeah, they glide. Yeah, they don't actually flap and fly, but they have, yeah, they climb up trees and they soar off and glide to this cool little layer of skin between their wrist and their, and their ankle, more or less. And they can glide and soar and adapt where they land. It's pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> and they'll eat all sorts of stuff. The northern flying squirrel, which we have very few of around here, they tend to eat a lot of like uh, lichens and fungi, and they actually spread all these through the forest, and it's actually really important. They eat and spread all these little fungi, and those fungi are important for the trees. Uh, they work with the trees to help the trees get their nutrients. So this is actually a really important critter, keeping the forest healthy. And we have a southern flying squirrel down here mostly, and that animal mostly eats nuts, mostly acorns, sometimes other seeds and stuff like that, hickory nuts. Um, and they'll huddle up in big groups like this sometimes. You get 15, 20 sometimes in a big tree. Usually it's just a couple, but on really cold nights, they will huddle together. Oh, flying squirrels. And there, it's, that's the kind of thing you might be driving at night and something just kind of goes whoosh, and you're like, what the heck? And it looks kind of white because they're really white underneath. And often that's flying squirrels. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those weird things you kind of, did I just see something? Uh, uh, but it happens uh, more than you think. And they're, like I said, they're pretty darn common. And they tend to live in hollows of trees, usually live trees that are just hollowed out in the middle. And, um, you know, if you have a tree like that, it looks like it has an active little hole in it. 
Don't do it on a really, really, really cold day, but on like a warmer day, you can just kind of tap on that tree with a stick or something, and they might pop their little head out. Um, it just happened Saturday. I was leading a group, and we were walking, and just kind of got lucky. <laughs> They're very excited. Um, so, yeah, and then they'll usually go right back in the hole because they don't like to be out during the day. It's not their thing. There's I just wonder what, how they learn to fly that well. Is there like a beginning school for you? <laughs> how do you just all of a sudden one day you fly, like a butterfly, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Yeah it's, yeah, it's been going on for millennia too, right? So there's some of it's hardwired, but I'm sure they have to learn some little tips and tricks. And they, they do, they are raised by their parents. They spend quite a bit of time with the parents too. Um, so my husband found um, a couple orphan baby flying squirrels. Oh. This was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Before we knew you're not supposed to do that. But <laughs> a long, long time ago. Sure. Raise them up and he um, could go outside peppy and squeaky. <laughs> And they'd climb up a tree and he'd whistle. I wasn't there, so I don't know. But he claims he could whistle and then they would fly back down and land on his shoulder. Yeah. People say that they do make good pets. You're not supposed to do that, but it is, it, it's, it's quite a common story. Yeah, like they actually adapt quite well to people. They don't do well inside though. They make quite a mess. They like to tear things apart and they like to pee on things and all that good stuff. Yeah, you know, but they're, they're pretty amazing critters. All righty. So, <clears throat> You know, a lot of people ask a lot of questions like, well, how do, they, how do animals deal with deep, deep snow, right? You know, your typical Welsh corgi is probably not well designed. It's got short little legs and all that kind of stuff. So if we look at the snowpack, so this is just kind of like a little cross section of like some proper deep snow, which we have not had at all this winter. It's been a very sad winter for snow. Um, we talk about, um, often you hear people, you might hear people say something called subnivian. And subnivian is just this little area kind of below the snow where the ground meets the snow. And that's where all the cool tunnels are. That's where all the highways are. Once we get a good pack of snow, it actually really insulates those animals down below. It keeps them safe from predators above, generally speaking. It gives them access to little grasses and other things and seeds on the ground. And that ground layer is actually relatively warm. Like when there's snow pack on the ground for a while, it's just around freezing, maybe a little warmer down there. So it could be zero up above or five degrees up above and it'll be like 34 down on the bottom there, 32. It's pretty, pretty, which is a huge difference when you're trying to save energy and stay warm. And then there's all sorts of tunnels and vents sometimes if the snow gets really deep in like places where there's serious snowpack like Alaska, you'll see voles coming up and making little vents to get air in their holes. Sometimes you'll get birds like the grouse, the one we were talking about at the beginning tonight. The grouse will actually make snow beds inside there and stay warm at night. It's way warmer than hanging out in a tree all night where it's really cold. Um, and it'll bust out in the morning as long as it doesn't get too icy. So this storm we're having now could be a little dangerous if you're a grouse. You don't want to bury in the snow if it's going to get an ice layer because you could get trapped. And that would not be good. Well, not good for you. Someone eventually find you and eat you and be happy they found a dead grouse. But, you know, if you're a grouse, you probably don't want that. Um, this little zoomed in picture here, these are little critters. And recognize those little, they'd be so tiny, they'd look like a speck of black pepper. These are little snow fleas or springtails, we call them. They're actually not fleas, they can't bite you, and they're probably the most abundant insect we have. The most, they're actually the most abundant animal in our forest. There can be over three billion per hectare in a New England forest. They're what we call detritivores. They eat dead and decaying material on the ground. You might have never thought of this, but if there weren't things eating leaves, we would have like leaves up to let's see, your rooftop, right? It's really important to have things that eat stuff and decay and, and decompose. So that's what they do. And there's millions of them um, all over the place, billions even. So insects in winter, they take two strategies. They uh, either tolerate freezing, and they basically tell, they basically in their cells, they actually, they actually allow themselves to freeze by putting all the water out of their cells and they form ice crystals between them so they don't actually like destroy and pop all their cells and their, then all their little tissue dies, that wouldn't be good. Or they use tons and tons of antifreeze to make it so that they can survive temperatures below freezing. It's a little risky, but they do it, um, and, they, and it's pretty amazing what they're able to do. Birds do all sorts of different things. Most, most migrate, but some stick around. They get fluffy and warm. Uh, they huddle together. Um, they do a variety of things. Here locally, you'll see, you know, we have robins in winter. They might be robins that were here in the summer, or they might be robins that winter here who live way further north. People are often surprised. They say, oh, there's robins back, but we actually have robins all year round. But they change their diet. They don't eat worms. They eat fruit because that's what's available. Or they eat your, you know, we have bluebirds, they're eating suet at someone's feeder, right? They can't get a lot of insects. So they just adapt, right? It's, that's just what you have to do. You can't just be all stubborn like, I only eat this. You can't be a picky eater if you're a wild animal. You gotta eat whatever's out there. 
So birds do a variety of things. Here's just a whole, this is a big chart. Uh, let me show you one or two things here that they do. This is kind of cool, pretty nerdy stuff right here. When a bird sends out warm, warm blood from its heart, and birds have higher body temps than we do. They're usually, depending on the bird, 103, 105, somewhere around there. They send that out. They don't want to send all that really hot blood out to those little bare naked feet, because that would be a waste. It would just dump all that heat out. So what they do is all that cold blood coming back mixes with all that warm blood by intertwining the veins and the arteries together. It's called countercurrent heat exchange. It's pretty sweet. So the blood coming back warms up before it hits the heart because you don't want really cold blood in your heart that's not good for you and you don't want to waste all the heat of the blood going out so this is these are little zoom ins of these so this is kind of what it looks like just different ideas so it's kind of all intertwined together because you know the only part of a bird that really does get cold is its feet and its face because they're covered in amazing feathers really 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 warm feathers that they keep really really uh well insulated and waterproof so they actually don't get wet even like ducks in the winter on the ocean and gulls, they're actually not getting wet except for the skin on their feet and their face. So these areas, they have made these cool, these different strategies over, you know, millions of years to be like, yeah, we could deal with that too, because we're birds and we're pretty awesome. We have some birds that nest really early in the year. So right now, if you're going to go up into the White Mountains, there's this bird who is probably starting to build nests like around this week, usually. And their nests, they'll even pluck all sorts of beautiful down feathers from themselves on the bottom of their nest before they lay their eggs. So they put them in a nice downy little area. A lot of ducks do that too. And they'll actually use anything they can. And then when it starts to snow, they'll just kind of fluff themselves up and try and keep those eggs warm. Um, these are called gray jays or Canada jays. This is a bird that's been hanging around people for a long, long time. They hang around camps, you know, of indigenous people. And hey, today you go hiking in the mountains, you know, and they come looking for food and snacks and handouts from you. It's really fun to feed them. I usually put little nuts on my head and my hat and they land on my head. It's really fun. So, jays are pretty sweet. So how do you adapt to winter? Because you're a mammal too, right? We're all mammals. I mean, we've lost most of our hair. That's a bit of a challenge. We've lost some of the best capacity to insulate ourselves. Fat and fur as mammals is the best way to stay warm. Um, but they come at a cost, right? Um, so, you know, in the old days, you know, here's some hominids, some of our old relatives hanging around being like, all right, what are you going to go for? The woolly rhino or the woolly mammoth? <sighs> it's a tough call, you know, with these little spears. Imagine that. That's a tough dinner right there to get, folks. That's a tough dinner. So, you know, we adapt today by using really warm clothing, right? In the old days, we were actually wearing animal skins. Now we're usually wearing faux fur and things like that. Um, you know, but we also can adapt by actually embracing winter in different ways, right? By training ourselves to get used to it. We have the ability to actually create brown fat, which is this energy producing heat and fat in our bodies by exposing ourselves to cold regularly. Uh, you have to be careful. You want to do it wisely because it can also hurt you if you don't do it it's really smart. If you just jump in like, you know, freezing cold water and having never done it. But there's, there's an initiative now where a lot of people are trying to intentionally expose themselves to cold regularly. And it actually, we're learning it's really good for our mental health and it's actually good for our physical health. There's all sorts of little dip clubs. That's a, that's a, that's a real face of someone getting out of cold water right there. There's one right here in New York. There's a great group that does these like almost daily little dips. Anyone can come, they're free. And you, they, people hold hands and go and make sure they learn how to do this safely. It's awesome. So, and this is traditional around the world all sorts of cultures have done like saunas and snow dips and road going in ponds and you know a hot hot and cold temperatures exposing ourselves to these things uh, to help us adapt into winter you know because we are mammals too so I just want to finish by saying you know there's a lot we can learn from our wild relatives here these stories of these cold survivors and next time you know you see a bird or a mammal or an insect in winter you know, just be curious act like what's happening here like what can I learn from this and there's probably a lot more for us to learn. I feel like it never stops for me, so I'm guessing the same is probably true for you. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions or hear some stories or anything else. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Thanks. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that um, I learned from you a long time ago is that. Um, you don't have to, uh, like this one for instance, you have, don't have to see the animal to really yeah. um, get be close, um, get a lot of information, mm -hmm. um, begin to understand what's going on, yeah. and like experience the animal, you don't have to actually plunk your eyes on it. Yeah. And that was like so valuable for mm. me to like think of it that way. Yeah. And 
I've become so much more appreciative to seeing all the things in the woods that animals leave behind that show that they were there yeah. recently or maybe a little while ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. a lot of stories out there that don't involve seeing them, absolutely. Yeah, smells, sounds, shapes, right? And the more we look, the more they start to stand out. Yeah. Hey, a really great fox, is it possible to have them both roam and three with? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I think I have. Absolutely. If I could tell the, uh, the young ones, too. Oh, cool. Yeah, they overlap. Oh, well, that's great. You got both. Yeah, Good for you. That's the impression I get, you know. Yeah. I got a couple of trail cameras out there. Oh, that's awesome. Right on. Another question in the middle? Yeah. yeah. I um, read something today where people perish 9 to 1 ratio, cold versus heat. One heat, hmm. nine cold. Oh, interesting. Like heat stroke versus like extreme hypothermia or something. Whoa. I wonder I what that's about. The source of it, you know, so you can't believe everything yeah. you need. I mean, it seemed attractive to me given what <laughs> I experienced huh. uh, tonight, tomorrow, et cetera. So. Yeah. I don't know. That's interesting. I never have it. I'm not familiar with that research. Yeah, I wonder what that's about. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, so the way I stay warm is I've got a little battery pack. I can press a little button here. Oh, nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah. which uh, wards off the cold. So <clears throat> this is a technological uh, that's, yep. adaptation. Mm, there are plenty of those. You even we'll mentioned skunks. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention skunks much, so they're they're kind of in that middle, like um, a lot like uh, raccoons. So they'll be out when it's generally above freezing for a bit, and in the next few weeks they're going to start to get ready and start to get courting and making a big stinky mess all over the place. Uh, there's a skunk and raccoon battle, or not battle, but uh, let's just say a, I don't know, they had a moment in my backyard the other night. Uh, I, my little light went on, and I was like, oh, let me go peek out the window, and, and I smelled skunk, and I saw this raccoon running away. They're right under the bird feeder. They must have been picking, you know, both arguing over who was going to get to feed underneath there, and uh, the skunk won. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You see animals all around Egg and Medicus Mountain, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, but, yeah, these could be anywhere. I mean, and actually, in many ways, there's even sometimes more diversity of species around suburban areas. Yeah. You know, habit. I see turkeys in Cambridge. Oh yeah! Oh gosh! Yeah, it's look how safe it is. I call them untouchables. No one's gonna get them, and you know, like it's like it's like the geese who live in the traffic circle in Portsmouth. Like, who's gonna get them? Pretty much nobody. They're safe. They're untouchable, right? Turkeys. I had a big flock of big male little gobbler gang. We call it hanging around this morning under my feeder, looking around, staring themselves in the window. You know, uh, and there, yeah, that's a, that's another species that's adapting really well. And when these winters are like this, and they're not, there's no deep snow. That's great for them because they don't do well in deep snow. Turkeys, they need they need to access the forest floor, <laughs> nuts and seeds and things like that, right? Um, so, yeah. But these winters where we're not getting a lot of snow, you know, it's it's good for some species. It's not great for others, you know. But other other questions, other anything else? It should have been the Johnny Cousin show back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Could you do the fox um, call one more time? Because yeah. I'm one of those yeah. people who thought that, that was a fish or a Yeah, baby. so now, so red fox will definitely do more like a hype. Well, they do a call when they're calling, trying to call each other together, often like a courtship long distance call. It's like a hi, like kind of like that. Yeah. Nighttime, yeah, okay, yeah. And then when there's fox, often like sometimes there's these wailing, moaning kind of courtship calls. They're like, ar, 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 and it almost sounds like, Krah! and and then there's also the another thing that people often uh, confuse or or attribute to Fisher, I should say, are literally cat battles. Use people's cats, feral cats, house cats out fighting, or, <laughs> like those insane. And also raccoons who will do very similar, intense kind of like. <laughs> That kind of noise, yeah. Oh, yeah. The barred owls. Oh, yeah. cooks for you? I heard that. Yeah, so this... the woods when I down in Mass. Yeah, this... This is... Mm-hmm. the woods, you walk the trails. I hear up here. This is a great time of year for that. I never heard it, so I believe that. Yeah, and they can even get monkey-like. Yeah. Communicate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same, we have the big great horned owls with the big little ear tufts, and the barred owls right now are all... They're all courting, you know. The great horn's more like a... And then the great, the bar down, kind of like that, yeah. But they'll often sometimes even just do this where like, you're like, 
Was that like a weird monkey owl? I don't know what that is. Yeah, uh, yeah they're wacky. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're all right now courting. Eagles are courting and starting to build nests right now. Red-tailed hawks are just starting. You'll see little pairs of hawks circling around. I yeah. Jason, you got your own wildlife reserve over there. Let's go, let's go to his place next time. Yeah, yeah. That's right here, the grouse. It sounds like knocking on wood, though. There you go. Yeah. Mm. All righty. Anything else before we wrap up? So aren't they, yeah. um, aren't the hawks, didn't they migrate? It depends on the hawk. So some hawks migrate, but this time of year, we have, in terms of hawks that overwinter here, we have red tails, sometimes red shouldered, more and more, that's now it's warmer. Uh, Cooper's hawks, sharp shin hawks, they're here year round. The hawks that migrate are often the broad wing, uh, and a few, of, there's a handful of others. I mean, actually, and there is some, even some sharp shins migrate, so some red, uh, you know, there's, it, it's, they don't all do the same thing. So it's a little tricky, right? So there's some Cooper's hawks who migrate and some will stick around. So, yeah, it depends. But the bulk of the hawks definitely migrate, uh, so there's a lot less of them in winter. But they're still food here because there's still other birds. That's why I tell people, if you put out bird feeders, just know that you're also feeding hawks. Because they know, you know, you feed all the birds. You can't just say, I just want to feed the cart. Well, you can say that, but you're going to be disappointed. Because the, because the bird, the hawks love feeders, especially if you put them way out in the open somewhere and there's no cover around. It's almost like, look, come and eat these hot little baby birds. Or not baby birds, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. Even when you put them under cover. Oh, yeah, they're still and good. They always come down and swoop in when I'm yeah. sitting there looking at the feeder. Lucky you. <laughs> Feathers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. A lot of drama. Yep. Well, the hawk's got to eat, too. All righty. Well, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Yeah, very well. Check out Dan's website. Yeah, Lead with Nature. Oh, and I'll, I have little stickers if you want stickers, and you can find my stuff.